fifty dollars in gas cards, uh, several smaller ones of twenty five dollars, and one grand prize of fifty. And uh, for our regular church members, you will not be included in that drawing. Uh, that will be just strictly for our guests. Uh, however, the member who does bring the most guests over the course of this month, that service included, that individual member does get a. A, uh, a prize of their own, a gift card to a restaurant or, or store of their choosing, and uh, within certain pastoral limits, if you say you wanted a gift certificate to, to the liquor store, I probably will uh, not say I will veto that. So I'll just tell you right away, we don't need any wine for communion, so well, we're good to go without that. But uh, it's going to be a fun time. Service will start at noon with a meal, concession style foods in the back. We're going to have a blast back there. We'll do the drawings. Uh, the cards will actually be handed out after service, so you do have to be in attendance for both the dinner and the, uh, the service afterwards uh, to receive the card. The grand prize winner, of course, will be announced during that time. Uh, Manuals keeping track of guests that have come, and uh, we'll be announcing some team totals this coming Sunday and uh, see who needs to start praying and working harder between Sister Kate and I because the loser gets a high in the face. Amen. All right. Well, I want to go into the Word of the Lord this evening. Uh, also, I want to remind you next week is our Disciples by Design Week. I remember each month this year we're going to have a different consecration, uh, a different type of fast, if you will, some way we set ourselves aside uh, to dedicate ourselves to the, the purpose for which we live. And uh, this month we're taking a week, and uh, you're going to get a handout this coming Sunday. And I'll ask you to read a certain scripture each day to write down what you fasted that day or how many meals you fasted that day. Uh, log in how much time you pray. Uh, I know uh, many times at uh, giving, at the end of the year, sometimes people are surprised at what they gave. Uh, they, they thought they were giving more than they did. And see, you just get a little here, a little there. They see, you know, you didn't really give God His portion. And uh, it's just a way to help you track and make you focus for a while on the fact that, you know what, disciples are made. Jesus told the church to go out and make disciples. And church, we're not going to accidentally stumble our way into heaven. Come on. I was talking to my son the other day. And I don't, he's not here tonight, so he can't tell me not to share this. But I know he likes to take takes uh, long walks. And uh, uh, he managed to get himself lost. It took a four and a half hour. Uh, was it four and a half hour, man? No, we're not talking about being about James. It took a four, four and a half hour walk and ended up having to use the GPS to to get his way back home. That was quite a, a long, enjoyable walk. But at some point he realized, you know what, I'm not going to get home just wandering around. And uh, he realized he lost his sense of direction and it's easy to do when the clouds are over the sky and you're not familiar with territory. And he had to get, what, get the direction to say, okay, this is where I want to go. This is what i got to do to get there. And you know, church, we're not going to just accidentally wander our way around and wind up going through the pearly gates. If we're going to get there, we're going to have to look at our lives and see where we are, find out, first of all, where am I? You are here. And we know where we want to go and read the directions and work our way, our way there. Amen. And so this evening I want to, uh, as we try to move into the future and, and, and accomplish what I believe God has called us to do as a church. Uh, I said last week I was going to get a, a six or seven part series on, on becoming a modern day Book of Acts church. Uh, you know, we don't live in the first century. They would be amazed at the things that we have available to us today. The tools of communication that we have, the, the means of entertainment, the, the abundance in our country of food uh, that's available. They would, they would drool at the number of Bibles we have in our homes we have access to. And, uh, just so many things that would be like magic to them. You know, when they wrote that every eye was going to see certain events take place in the earth, in the earth when, when John wrote those things 2,000 years ago, he had no picture like we do of how you can actually stand here today and I could hook up my iPad or Nathan could do his or you could hook up your phone and actually have a video chat with somebody on the other side of the globe if they're awake right now. And actually sit there and have care of the conversation. And you know, so if they're standing there and there's a car wreck outside and they're filming, they can, you could be seeing that in real time. We live in a world that's just amazing. Yet 
For all it's amazing, this God hasn't changed. The things that God desires from us in our lives are the same. His goal for us is the same. He wants us to go to heaven. And so we, in order to make it to where we want to go, heaven, and where He wants us to go, heaven, we've got to, to become what He wants us to become. Now, I will say that with a caveat. You will never be perfect, nor will I. However, I'm greatly convinced that there's a whole lot to be said for what direction you're going. Okay? And so God wants us to be heading in the right direction. And so as a church, I'm asking God, okay, God, what do we need to be? What are some, some characteristics we need to, be, need to have if we're going to be a, a Book of Acts church in the 21st century? You know, uh, there's some things that we just can't copy from the first century. However, the things that God requires of us, those things are still just as valid today as they were back then. And uh, you can put a different facade on things. As I was going down the road this afternoon, I heard a guy talking about how he wanted to do his house, and he uh, was selling a certain product to transform your house into a stone-looking house. It wouldn't be real stone, but it was super easy to put up and make your house look like the real thing. And he was talking about how easy it would be to transform the place you live. And you know, we live in a a world that is is focused upon the looks and the appearance. God wants us to be what we are all the way through. So I'm not just interested in seeing us change our appearance. I'm not looking for a change of siding or a, a new layer of shingles and change of color, but what I'm looking for God to do with us is to remake us as a church from the inside out. I'm asking God to remake me as a pastor from the inside out. And I'm asking us together to say, okay, God, what do we need to be what you want us to be? And I'm not going to do a verse-by-verse -verse expository message or series of messages on the book of Acts. That would take far longer than I have the self-discipline to work my way through. It would be more weeks than you'd want to have in a row. But for six or seven weeks, I'm going to try to look at some of the things in the book of Acts that that we need to take on to ourselves and we're going to tonight I'm not going to preach from any one verse necessarily but just kind of pull an overview and say what the materials that we need to be building with or what are some of the structural things that we need to have in us and just for a, a verse tonight if, if the uh, brother Emmanuel put a uh, Acts chapter 1 verses 1 and 2 up there and then just, just leave it up there. And I will read some scriptures too as we go through. But I want to leave that verse up there for a reason. Because I want to close with my text tonight rather than open with my text. But uh, in order to be a 21st century Book of Acts church, a church that God built and that God loves and that God indwells, I think we need to realize that the book of Acts is a unique book in Scripture. There are 66 books in the Bible. And it could be said that the book of Acts is the center of them. Now, if you don't get your Bible, start counting and see if it's numerically in the center because it's not. And some might be more prone to say that Jesus was what the center of it is. And you're right about that. That would not be an incorrect answer by any means. However, you can look at it from another standpoint and also say that the book of Acts is the center. It's the focal point. How can you say that? Everything in the Old Testament brings us to Christ. However, Jesus came to build a church. Hello? Jesus came for that express purpose to build a church, to save mankind, bring us together in His body. He came to build a church. All the epistles from Romans through Revelation, uh, those books tell us how to live in this church that we're born into. The book of Revelation tells us how He comes back to gather those who are in this church that He built. But it's the book of Acts that actually shows the birth of the church. 
This book of Acts it actually shows us what the, the first century church was like. Without, without the book of Acts, we wouldn't really know what kind of outreach they did. We wouldn't know what was the normal experience for someone who comes into the church. But because of the book of Acts, we can see what some of the, 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 the normal things that an apostolic church did. What's a church supposed to be like? And church, there's all kinds of groups in this world that call themselves churches. And, and I'm not knocking any of them. But I'm saying if we're going to be what God wants us to be, we can't look at this church, we can't look at that church, or we can't look at this building or that building and say, we want to be like that. It may be God's will for us to grow to 500 and never have a building. Some of the largest churches in America went into thousands before they ever owned property. There's pluses and minuses both ways, and I believe in owning property. What I'm saying is what God wants us to do is to become a church that He's the center of. And every church, to some degree, will have its own identity. It'll have its own flavor, just like every family does. But yet, within each church, if it's a, 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 a church that Jesus builds, there's going to be some characteristics that are the same. as a, a statement about what it's supposed to be like. Now when I grew the church that I was brought up in, we never went away from a service and said, wow, that was a good church. Someone might say, boy, brother, so-and-so or pastor so-and-so preached a good message today. Never that he would talk about, wow, what an awesome altar service that was. Or what a great move of God that was. Or, man, that was just awesome church. But yet we see things in the book of Acts that lead us to believe that they were to describe what they were involved in. That's the kind of stuff they would have said. We see things happening in the book of Acts that uh, unfortunately, although they happen in our church, they don't happen nearly enough in our church. Amen. Okay? And so I want to see God take us and and, and revel, I, I hate to use the term, it sounds so cliche, but to really remake us. To I don't want to do a rebrand. I don't want to just slap a new brand on, but I want to be made over. And I want to see this church become the church that not only is about what God was, but about what God is. He's not the God of I was. He didn't tell Moses I was that I was, but He said I am that I am. And today He is that He is, and that means He is a God who still does the things that we see in the book of Acts. He still works miracles. Amen. He still heals the sick. He still can raise the dead. Yes, I've read and heard testimonies of those who have died in our day and age who have been resurrected from the dead. It doesn't happen all the time, and neither did it in the book of Acts. So understand the book of Acts happened over about 30 years. And so we've got the headlines. And just like everything that was done in the book of Acts during that time is not written, so everything that's done in our world we may not hear about. But just understand today, God is doing just as much today, yea, more, because of how many of there are of us who are part of His church. He's doing more today in the way of miracles than He was doing back then even. That's the way God wants it to be. The, the teaching that we have, it, it needs to be the same as what the, the book of Acts church taught. It should be a message of power, a, a message of deliverance from sin, a message of of overcoming. It needs to be a message that, that talks about lives being changed. The baptismal formula that we use, it needs to be the same as what the early church taught. The, the focus that we have needs to be the same as what the early church taught. The demonstration of God's power, the gifts of the Spirit. It's been too long since we've had the operation of the gifts of the Spirit in our services. Come on. That means, lets me know that we need to align ourselves some. 
from the pulpit to the pew and from the pew to the pulpit. We need to search ourselves and align ourselves so that God can operate through us. And I know when people say that, when you say something like that, they're saying, I don't want to, well, I don't want to be the one to give a message in tongues. And someone else will say, I don't want to be the one that interprets. Well, you know what? That's the wrong way to look at it because that's only right. just one and two of the gifts. And they were the last ones mentioned. I want to see people operating in the word of wisdom and the word of knowledge and the discerning of spirits and gifts of healing and gifts of faith and working of miracles. Come on. Those are the things that I want to see God doing. He tells interpretation is great. It's just another level of God communicating to His church when there's an interpretation. But I want to see all those other seven gifts in operation as well. It's time for us to be a Book of Acts church. A modern day Book of Acts church. We're not going to stick our heads in the sand and pretend that electricity doesn't exist. And we're not going to shun technology because technology has a potential for abuse. But rather, we're going to use it responsibly and we're going to communicate in the world in which we live. Facebook is a great tool. You can communicate a lot on Facebook. Having said that, I see a lot of stupidity on Facebook as well. Amen. We're going to be a 21st century church, maybe in our flavor, but our foundation and our structure and the way we interact with people is going to be twenty. Sorry, it's going to be foundations are founded on the Book of Acts. In every way that's possible, we need to be that. Why? Because I believe that God blesses the most. Those are the closest to what He wants. And so the question is not whether or not we should be uh, a twenty-first century Book of Acts church, but what we need to do to become one. And look, that's why would anybody even settle for anything less? I've had people say, well, Pastor, I don't want the, the power of the Holy Ghost in my life. But, you know, when someone says that, I think that's such an ignorant. And I don't mean that mean. You, you can fix ignorant. There's things I'm ignorant of. Ignorant is just lack of learning. There's things I, you know, if I'm ignorant of something, I can, I can learn. I, I was preparing for a Bible study with someone the other day that I was told was having some questions about whether the Bible was real and stuff. I'm not sure which way I was going. And I, I had I went gathered some information and it, it did me good because I relearned or remember some things and saw a couple of verses I hadn't really got a hold of before in, in the Bible that talked about dragons and and smoke coming from their nostrils and stuff and and it talked about you know critters with tails like cedar trees and and skin that was harder than iron. You know, before the word dinosaur was invented in the late 1800s, early 1900s, the Bible talked about all those critters that we read about and study about. They live, they breathe, they're real. And mankind saw them. That's why there's cave drawings of dinosaurs. That's why there's pottery from the early centuries with pictures of triceratops on them. That's why Glen Rose, Texas has been there, seen it. That's why in Glen Rose, Texas, there's a riverbed that's got uh, uh, dinosaur tracks and human footprints side by side embedded in the rock. Man came up with this funny idea that they lived millions of years ago and we never saw them. The Bible never said that. The Bible says we saw them. Clearly. History says, archaeology says we saw them. It doesn't fit in with what the schools teach and the, and the science, some scientists want to teach because it doesn't fit in with their way of explaining our existence without God. But the Bible is just pretty clear about it. Yeah, they existed. They were here. We saw them. Amen. Getting off track a little bit. But, getting back on, on, on the theme, let me say I don't have time tonight to, to, or even in the next seven weeks to probably say everything needs to be said. So let me, just, let me just settle down here. First and foremost, eight things I want to share tonight. Seven or eight things. Because I'm far again. First of all, the Book of Acts Church has got to be an empowered church. Acts 1 and 8. But you shall receive power. Luke chapter, at the end of Luke, they were told, before I misquote the verse, I'll just tell you what it says. At the end of Luke, they were told to go to Jerusalem and wait until they were endued with power from on high, until they were filled with the promise of the Father. And at the beginning of the chapter of chapter 1 in Acts, they were told that they were to receive this miraculous 
power from God when the Spirit of God came on them. I'm telling you today, the reason that so that Christianity has become associated with dead, dull, dry, and boring is because Christianity has refused to acknowledge that the God of Scripture is alive and well and moves in those who will let Him. God wants His church to be an empowered church. We're not to be dead. We're not to be uh, rusty. We're not to be uh, fallen. But rather, we're to be alive and living and, and, and vibrant. We're, to spoke, we're, we're a church that's supposed to have blood flowing through our veins. And I'm not talking about having live human beings. Uh, we all are alive, but you know what? I've been to some churches. You wondered if anybody had a pulse. Come on. People say, well, church is supposed to be dignified. I believe in dignity. I believe in respect and reverence. And there's times that the, whole, the living Spirit of a holy God will move into a service. And I've seen services that were loud and boisterous just turn just like that. And the next thing you know, people are down on their knees and they're weeping and crying. I've seen in this church where in the middle of a service, someone, the, the Spirit of the service would just change and people will come to the altar before an altar call was even given before the preaching even why because God was wanting reverence and God was wanting people to seek Him right then it's a living thing church is supposed to be an alive thing it's something where we participate in where we move and we breathe and we live and, and we do things and, and it's not just for the preacher but it's for you yes. Amen. we come together and we work and we worship and we give of ourselves to God we need to realize that we have some things that everybody needs. When Peter went to the tabernacle that day and he saw the lame man there, he said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Peter didn't have medical knowledge. I've been listening to my wife quoting words and memorizing stuff and, and, and struggling with this nursing stuff and she's trying to to, to work her way through and what I had to go was me kind of memorize all that stuff. Peter didn't have that medical knowledge. But Peter, when he saw a need, he said, you know what? I don't have the physical knowledge to, to fix your problem. I don't have the resources to make your life easy. But you know what I do have? In the name of Jesus Christ, Rise up and walk. He had faith that God was able to heal. And church, we're a living church that's full of power. And if we are, are Jesus' children, we're His disciples, we have that same power. What did Peter have? He had the Holy Ghost. He didn't have a nursing license. He didn't have a degree in counseling. He wasn't trained in life skill certification. But rather, he had the Holy Ghost. He had the power of Almighty God. The fire of God, if you will, that was moving inside of him and living inside of him. Acts 48 says that you shall be witnesses unto me. After they received the power, they are to be witnesses. A uh, book of Acts church is not only to be filled with power, but it's to be a church of people that are witnesses. You see, they were evangelistic, I believe, because they realized that their power was in their message. Peter realized he didn't have anything to offer. You know what? I don't really have anything to offer. I'm not a genius. I don't have the college degree. A lot of college, a lot of good grades. Never finished until we got the piece of paper. Bummer. But you know what? I can sit down with anybody and talk to them and tell them about a message and an experience that changed my life. That moved me from the category of drunkard to the category of sober. That put me from the path of going to hell to the path of going to heaven. That put me from caring about this world to caring about making sure I made it to the other side in good condition. We have an empowered message. We need to lay aside our our fear. We need to lay aside our shame. And you know, it's easy to to get caught up in yourself and your inabilities. And and you've heard me say this before. I want to say it again because it's right here. You know, the Bible. You know, you know, not every um, thing that you read in the Bible is true. Hello. Did I get your attention. 
We read the Bible where Abraham told, told, told someone his wife was his sister. Well, it was a half truth. We see where Moses told God when he was being asked to do something that he said, I stutter. I, I'm, I'm bad at speech. When we read in the book of Acts where it says Moses was learned and with excellent in wisdom and knowledge of how to talk. But one of those two things is wrong. I personally believe it shows Moses making excuses before God. Amen. And we see when he got before Moses, he I mean, got before Pharaoh, he was able to talk just fine. And somehow he managed to delegate to those 70 elders and he managed to take all the people's problems. He had the goods. He just was afraid he couldn't do it. So why am I, I share that again? Because sometimes we can look at our inabilities. We can look at our weaknesses and our failures. And we can think that we're not able to talk to someone about God. But I'm here tonight to tell you that all you've got to do is share your testimony. Witness to them about what God has done in your life. We don't need to get caught up in what we can't do. But rather, get caught up in what He is able to do. By doing that, the first century church was a church that carried the gospel to the entire world. They took it to the strong, and they took it to the rich, and they took it to the poor, they took it to the weak, they took it to those that had nothing. They took it to everyone. But they made themselves known. I read a man of God that I respect one time make the statement he worked in a certain factory. He says, I don't know if anybody there really knows I'm a Christian or not. I don't talk about it very much. I just try to live it. Well, that's good. But you know what? I disagree with his method and his understanding. I believe that we need to talk about our faith. Amen. Amen. That's right. There's a certain minority in this country that is very vocal. There's only about 10% of them or maybe less population-wise, but they're in the news every day. Carrying on marches and holding rallies and raising funds and fighting for legislation and fighting for this and fighting for that. They don't have a lot of numbers, but they strongly believe what they're saying and they're really vocal about it. Church, we need to strongly believe what we're saying more than they strongly believe what they're saying. And we don't need to be ashamed to stand up for what we believe. We don't need to be able to stand up and be ashamed of the fact that, that Jesus Christ is alive. That yes, He died, but He resurrected. Yes, He was a teacher, but He was also God in the flesh. And yes, I've got the Holy Ghost. And yes, I spoke in tongues. And yes, I believe in miracles. And yes, I've been baptized. And yes, He took my sins away. And yes, I I failed God since I got in church, but yes, He forgave me and He's changed me. Paul said in Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the Gospel of Christ. It's the power of God and the salvation to everyone that will believe. I think it's time that we need to realize just who we are and what we really have. And I know that's a cliche. It's said a lot. And I hesitate to even use it. But I believe there's a very fine line between where revival is and where revival isn't. And I believe that we're very close to that line. And I believe that we have got to have a mindset change so that we step over the line from where it isn't quite to where it absolutely is. Right. We're an empowered church in God's eyes with an empowered message. This world doesn't need more religions. It doesn't need more church buildings necessarily. It doesn't need more messages. What it needs is for the church that Jesus built to stand up and declare the message that He declared and live the life that He proclaimed and proclaim the power that He has given. We've got a message, church, that will absolutely set a captive free. That will absolutely bind up someone who's broken hearted. That will absolutely encourage those that are discouraged. It will fill that emptiness that exists inside everybody. And I believe that the key to stepping over that line lies within our mouths and within our hearts. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I heard on the radio today, someone talking about something and they said, you know, they just keep saying it over and over even though it's not true. And there's a law in communications, if you say something long enough, 
You'll start believing it. You say it long enough, others will believe it as well, whether it's true or not. And what has happened is the enemy has become emboldened and has repeated lies over and over and over while the church has bought into a lie that we cannot say anything lest we offend somebody. I'm not talking about being mean or hateful, but Jesus loves everybody. Jesus wants to change everybody's life. The Holy Ghost is real. It'll change your life. It'll turn you inside out. It will make you a different person. And we cannot be quiet about it and be what God wants us to be. The early church declared that Jesus rose from the grave. Now, I, don't, I don't know anybody's background here. And, and if, it's your, if it's your, this is your background, I'm not trying to offend anyone at all. But I saw an article in the news the other day uh, about a certain group that was observing the, 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 the church-wide uh, you know, Christian uh, thing about uh, uh, ash on the forehead for Lent. And they and said, for all my, my busy people that are too busy to come in and pray and do the regular ceremony, we're having what we call an ash and dash. And you just drive up and they roll down the window, they dab some ash on the forehead, put a little old said, quick prayer and send you on your way. Drive through for... For consecration, I, I, I just I thought it was kind of it was kind of funny. We want things to be that way, but God wants us to not proclaim by just symbols, but rather He wants us to proclaim by the lives that we live and the work words that we speak. And somebody say, Amen. Amen. They talked wherever they were. They talked in Walmart. They talked at the grocery store. They didn't have Walmart. You know what I'm saying? They talked in the markets. They talked in the jobs. They talk to their families. And church, one of the things that this church has got to become, if we're going to be what God wants us to be, is we've got to become somehow, some way, an evangelistic church where we're not afraid to share with people about what Jesus has done. Our job is to plant seed and water it. Only God can make you make you make them become, become a Christian. Only God can cause them to repent. Only God can move on to fill them with the Holy Ghost. Only He can take their sins away. But we have been given the seed. We must plant it. We must water it. We must work with people. We've got to share this message. We can't hoard it. We can't, we can't hold it back. But rather, we've got to be willing to share it with others. We've got to be people of the name. I'm looking. I'm only on number three. And I've got to get to seven or eight tonight. We've got to be people of the name. When the beggar at the temple was laying there and he was wanting some money. Alms, alms, alms. Can I have some money? Can I have some money? Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold, but in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Later, he went on to explain that there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby men can be saved. And church, we've got to realize we are people of the name. We are the ones who will take you to a tank of water and just like the early church did, we will put you under water in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Burying you, so to speak, in baptism just like they did in the early church. Why? Because we realize it was Jesus' death and burial and resurrection that brings us our power. Just like He died on the cross, we died and we, we repent. Just like He was put into a tomb, we go into a watery grave. Uh, identifying with Him as His name is called out. Just like He came out, changed. We come out of that water, changed. God fills us with the Holy Ghost. Come us by speaking a language that only He gives us. Amen. We're people of the name. Acts 3.13 says, The God of Abraham and God of Isaac and the God of Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified His Son Jesus, whom, whom you delivered up. His name, through faith in His name, made this man strong. And church, we need to realize that any power that we have, any effectiveness we have, has got to be through the name of Jesus Christ. We've got to be proud of that name. Not just a bumper sticker, not just a label, not a banner in a sanctuary. Acts 4.10, Peter declared, Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by Him does this man stand here before you hold. Church, I stand here today because of Jesus Christ. You sit here tonight as a child of God because of Jesus Christ. He is the reason. He is the stone, it went on to say, which was set at the knot of the builders, that has become the head of the corner. And neither is there salvation in any other We've got to be become people of the name of Jesus. Say it with me. Jesus. Jesus. 
I know someone's going to ask me about it. I've already had a couple of questions about this movie, Son of God is coming out. I don't care if you watch it or not. It'll be accurate in some ways. It won't be accurate in others. I honestly do not believe that Jesus had long hair. It'll never convince me of it because of what Scripture says. But they'll have, they'll have some good things in it. Use it as a witnessing tool. Talk to people about it. Don't be afraid of it. Just let them know that anytime Hollywood tries to interpret the Bible, they don't quite usually get it right. Just like any other book that they make into a movie, they have to leave so many things out. Do you realize that when you speak the name of Jesus, things happen. Heaven hears you. When you pray, you're supposed to pray in the name of Jesus. So when you call that name out in prayer, God hears you. The angels hear you. Hell trembles when you get to call the name of Jesus. That's pretty amazing. No matter how weak you are, when you call on His name, it makes the devil fearful. Sickness, demons, will flee at the voice of the weakest, most physically unimpressive, mentally unimpressive person alive. As long as they are sincere, that person can call on the name of Jesus. If they've been filled with the Holy Ghost, they don't have to be a, a, a road scholar. They don't have to have power over this world. They don't have to be of great stature. But if they are sincere,